Good, well, um, good morning, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. My name's Martin Cave. I'm a professor at Warwick Business School, um, and I've been taking an interest in the regulation of the, the sector for a number of years. This is my first time in Qatar. Um, I'm very glad to see the sun for the first time for about four months, um, and I'm looking forward to the way in which this, um, this conference will develop. <coughs> this panel um, is devoted to broadband trends in the Middle East and what can be learned from elsewhere. Um, I think we've heard from the, from the previous speaker um, how important broadband is throughout the world. It's been described as a general purpose technology and I think it's the most important general purpose technology that's emerged in the 21st century. We've seen how it can influence both production and consumption. There's a lot of focus on meetings like this about consumption, but production is very important, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises, giving them access to technologies and capabilities which otherwise would, would be confined to a, a small number of, of leading states. In consumption, as we've heard from the previous speaker, we're talking not only about what I might describe as private consumption, entertainment, but also fundamentally about the consumption of public goods, such as health, e-government, things of that kind, replacement of paper methods by electronic methods. All these things are hugely important, and we've already seen World Bank studies which, which demonstrate that an increase in broadband penetration can have a major effect upon economic growth, and therefore, by implication, a country which fails to um, to, to get on that particular train uh, is going to suffer by comparison with others. So I, I'm not surprised but delighted to see that ICT Qatar has come up with a, a comprehensive program for ensuring that this country benefits from, from those advantages. Now what do you need for the thing to work? Well, first of all, clearly, you need access to networks. And we've heard about the degree to which that is likely to be provided particularly in a competitive environment, but also that there's a need for government intervention to ensure that remoter areas also get access in order to provide universal service and ensure that everybody benefits. But another key point, which we'll revert to, I'm sure, throughout the day, is the importance of the, what I might describe as the collateral investments. Um, these would be PCs for households which find difficulty in affording PCs, other devices for people who don't particularly want PCs, but nonetheless have to be brought into the broadband network, particularly for the delivery of public services. And I'm thinking here, perhaps of older people. Um, and also just general increases in, in educational capability and human capital throughout the region. So it's a, it's a very big and important agenda. And I think ICT Qatar is well placed to pursue it because it's able to adopt a holistic approach, not only regulating networks, but also ensuring that these other investments um, come into play. Now, the panel which we, we have this morning um, is a very interesting one. I'll very briefly introduce the, the, all the speakers, if I may, um, and then ask them to deliver their, their presentations um, in sequence. Uh, we've reserved, we're reserving um, 20 minutes um, for discussion afterwards, um, and I, I'm hoping that um, the audience will participate in this, and I may turn my attention to particular people and ask them for their views, so, so watch out particularly those sitting in the front row. Um, uh, and, and, and don't forget, too, that you will have the protection of the, the famous Chatham House rules, which means that whatever you say, as a member of the, the audience, it can't be quoted against you um, in any, any future circumstances. So the three presentations which we have, first, we begin with um, Hamoud bin Hamanat al Qusayar, who's Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Regulatory Public Affairs at Saudi Telecom and he will give a perspective from, from his, his country and from the Middle East. Then we have a perspective from Asia by Sandar Chuk, um, who's the head of regulatory, the regulatory division of OFTA, um, the, uh, the telecoms regulator in Hong Kong. Now, anybody who has the slightest acquaintance with the Hong Kong market uh, will probably have been as staggered as I have by the, by the speed and quality and cheapness of the services prevailing there. It's, it's like nowhere else on earth in, in my experience. So, so that is a success story, which we'll want to hit, learn from. And then finally, Dr. Jeffrey Cole of the, the Annenberg Center um, at the University of Southern California, a place which I've had the benefit of visiting, and I can assure you it's a very pleasant environment, will give a talk about broadband and the consumer, what do we know? Now, I've asked the speakers to confine themselves to 
to 15 minutes, and I, I will sort of signal to them when we're approaching the end of that period um, in order to ensure that the, we have a, a scope for, for, for broader discussion. So without further ado, let, let me invite um, Hamoud bin Hamad al Qusayar to make the first presentation from Saudi Telecom. Thank you. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I will be challenged because some of my thoughts and uh, ideas already, Dr. Hussar already talked about them. Uh, maybe I will start by saying that the MENA region is uh, in the recent years uh, noticing uh, decline in the growth of, uh, of the mobile uh, revenue and also uh, declining in the revenue itself and the growth of the, of the fixed uh, revenue. Uh, and this is uh, obvious because we are reaching in the mobile uh, about the saturation. We have very high penetration. Uh, uh, we reach very high penetration. And also in the fixed already is competed by the mobile. People are uh, with the competition and, and the involvement of the mobile, uh, people are leaving the voice application. This is now mainly voice application. But the good news is that broadband expected to experience significant growth, similar to what happened in the mobile. In the mobile, in the last decade, we uh, uh, about four times the growth, uh, we noticed four times growth. And uh, uh, I think in the, the, the second wave of growth in revenue in the region and internationally is in the broadband. Uh, I, I will just take you, your attention to something. I mean, if uh, ten years ago, if somebody came to the household and told him that uh, you will pay four times or five times uh, your bill, he will not believe that. He will not expect it. I mean, people were not thinking about that. But today, because of the mobile, everybody using the mobile in the home, more than the fixed, we are already paying about four, five times the, 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 the revenue. And uh, uh, this has developed the sector and improved the sector. And uh, why is that? We are, because we need mobile, we need the application. And I think this is the same situation will happen in the broadband. The broadband will be vital for the people. The application will be vital. So I think it's, there is another wave uh, that will take this sector high, which is the broadband and the application of broadband. Uh, especially in the Middle East, we are in this area, we are privileged. I mean, we already now, there is a forecast of about 20% uh, revenue increase. Uh, but I think this is also without the new uh, uh, planning uh, of the uh, fiber networks. Why broadband is, is, is vital? I think uh, it, uh, it was uh, noticed that 10% penetration is correlated with 1.5 growth in productivity. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is vital for the, for the economy and uh, vital for the country. I mean, if you increase 1.5 growth in the productivity, uh, this is really potential for the whole region. Same wise with uh, competitiveness. Uh, it was shown that, uh, I mean, there is a, a strong link in, uh, between the national competitiveness and broadband penetration. And you can see that, uh, I mean, our region still have uh, huge potential to grow, and this is really opportunity. Uh, if I will go just uh, to give idea about uh, STC, what we done as incumbent operator, and we need to invest in the broadband. Uh, uh, our strategy was in two phases. I mean, we took uh, uh, two things. I mean, we are trying to increase penetration of the broadband and uh, uh, also optimize uh, surfaces and something. But our next uh, phase is maximizing customer lifetime value. We need to give customer more value, more application, more entertainment, and this will really fulfill his potential. Our way, our path for that, we started by pure connectivity. We were offering just pure connectivity. And then after that, we add application. We became application provider and internet provider. And then the end that we like to be is the broadband multi, uh, multimedia service provider. 
where we can merge, uh, uh, I mean, gaming, advertising, IBTV, networking, and content. Our home uh, sector uh, is, is have a strategy of five pillars. Uh, first of all, we wanted to increase the speed that we are offering to the customers. I mean, you know that we started initially with low speed, and then gradually we are trying to give the more speed to the customers, sometime uh, uh, by encouraging them by uh, promotions, by advertising, and uh, sometime uh, we, uh, we yani, give them the, the, the situation that they must take the highest speed, and they need it anyway. Uh, so this is the uh, first one. And then uh, penetration, increased penetration by uh, having different offers, by uh, trying to reach sector that we couldn't reach before. And uh, uh, this is, was essential for us, and we will continue. Also, the third one is to develop portal for the customers. And we have a portal called uh, Ma'akum. And it is now a successful portal uh, where people, I mean, uh, I mean, like mo all my children use this portal all the time. And uh, uh, they go to that portal, they find content, which is very uh, controlled content and very news and gaming, uh, sport, everything. And we think this is essential. You need to develop the right content for the people to uh, evolve the application. Finally, we need to adopt the IBTV. Uh, we notice very huge growth. It's exponential growth in the last few years only. And in the fixed, uh, in 2008, we closed by about 1 million. Now we are reaching 1.4 million. And Macom, we reach about 50,000 uh, uh, user. Uh, Saudi Arabia in total, because of the growth of broadband, is uh, in, in 2008, it, in the, by end of 2008, it was the fourth uh, uh, growth country. It was ranked as the fourth uh, in, in, internationally in the growth of, of broadband. Saying that, this is not enough. I think we are looking for the future, and the future have more, uh, uh, have more uh, uh, opportunities for us. Uh, higher speed surfaces is required, much more than what we are offering today. I mean, we should reach one giga, 100 mega and one gigabit, because there are application uh, and promise of application that require that high speed uh, network. And the whole country is depending on that. Yeah, I mean, telelearning, telemedicine, uh, or e-commerce and uh, e-applications. And uh, in this case, uh, I mean, there should be uh, 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 investment in the future of these networks. And that, of course, will, will serve LTEs and uh, will, will uh, connect fiber to everybody. W what's the problem of broadband? Why in the past, in, in the country that uh, Europe and internationally faced that difficulty? It was because of two things, uh, regulation and uh, financial situation. And in, in, in uh, Europe, the regulation was restricting investment by the operators in the right time. And uh, that was because uh, uh, cost-based regulation, high royalty, and uh, retail regulation, and many others. This is maybe Dr. Hussa already mentioned, uh, mentioned this. And because of that, people, uh, operators in Europe were sensitive about investing that because they don't know that they will get their uh, investment back. And also now the situation of the financial crisis put more pressure in, uh, in this investment. If we take a, just a glance about how much that will cost uh, the operators, as example, it will cost Deutsche Telekom about, if they take 10% uh, yearly uh, CAPEX, it will take them 25 years uh, to fund this uh, project. So it is a cost, tremendous cost to the fixed operator, especially now the revenue is not coming to the fixed operator, it's coming to the mobile operator, that they are not interested in this, although they need it. So I mean the investment is required for the whole country, no operator will do without it, I mean the fixed operator need it, the mobile operator need it for their future services, LTE will not work without fiber connectivity, but I mean uh, the situation is, it's a lot, did luck. 
Internationally, uh, leaders are uh, all leaders, I mean now, it is, saying that the broadband is the solution for the country and it's the evolution uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the business and it is essential. This is why, uh, with this realization, many countries start to fund uh, expansion in the, in the network, in the, fixed, in the fiber network, and be vital. There are a variety of models, but I mean, in total, the message is that uh, the countries and the government are involved to uh, initiate, if you like, and uh, initiate the sector. And with the promise that uh, when, when this, you build the network, uh, uh, the whole growth, the whole imagination will happen. And uh, uh, some country, in fact, I visit some of them, went further to that. They said, we will not just uh, support building the network, but we will, build, uh, we will uh, support stimulating the demand. And that is essential for them. And I think it is essential. This has come to my second slide. At, uh, <clears throat> uh, I mean, it's important that the government in the MENA region is uh, 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 implement cross-sector IT uh, uh, plans and uh, also stimulate the demand and relax the regulation. Uh, stimulate demand is important. I mean, Singapore, they have a quite a huge group of people just to stimulate the demand. They are not just supporting building the network, but they have a group that we ha where they are targeting specific applications. Because if you just build the network without application, without stimulation of the demand, nobody will win. It will not be a, a, a good uh, business case. And finally, also, you need to have the right re uh, regulation uh, for that business case to succeed. And uh, uh, you, you need the group and the, the sector to be more uh, cooperative sector, more uh, working together positively to evolve the sector. This is my end of the Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that, was, that was very interesting and raised a lot of um, pertinent questions about whether in order to encourage the construction of, um, of new fiber-based networks, we need to revisit the, the access regime, the, the regulation of access um, by competitors to, um, to uh, assets built by the incumbent. Well, we're now going to hear from, um, from, from, from Hong Kong, as I've indicated, um, from Santa Chuk, um, from OFTA, the Hong Kong regulator. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Asia is uh, leading the world in terms of uh, broadband deployment and take up. Uh, according to uh, a survey done by OECD, the more developed economies, uh, in terms of household penetration of broadband, Korea is number one among the more developed economies. And if we use the same set of data, though Hong Kong is not a member of OECD, uh, we can conclude that Hong Kong will rank number three in terms of broadband penetration uh, for 2008. For deployment of uh, the more uh, high speed, next generation uh, optical fiber based infrastructure, the situation is even more impressive for the Asian economies. So according to uh, some of uh, the latest survey done by the FTTH Council, uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, Japan, Taiwan, and all these uh, Asian economies, they scored the top position in FTTH and FTTP deployment in the world. So what's the reason behind we believe that uh, consumer demand is, of course, a very uh, important drive for broadband development. And uh, I'm not going to go into details because I think Dr. Cole and other more distinguished speakers uh, in later part of this forum will be more qualified than me to delve into the details. But uh, we should not forget that uh, behind these uh, impressive broadband developments in Asia, they are driven by a more proactive government role uh, for these uh, broadband uh, developments. So uh, among those uh, 
economies that I have mentioned, except for Hong Kong. Uh, these economies have uh, some kind of a national broadband development program, uh, in particular to drive the deployment of the high-speed next-generation broadband networks. So I take, for example, the Japan, they have a U Japan policy package. Um, in Korea, they have a plan for deploying a uh, U broadband convergence network targeting to um, provide uh, broadband up to uh, one gigabit per second to the 90% uh, of population in uh, 210 or 212. In Singapore, um, uh, they have the next generation national broadband network which is uh, primarily funded and or subsidized by the government. And it will also target to roll out to 95% of population uh, for a speed of uh, 100 megabit per second or even to one gigabit per second in a few years time frame. And last year, Australia also announced its plan to uh, create a state-owned company to build a national broadband network with government funding of uh, nearly uh, a billion of dollars uh, within eight years. So um, it seems that uh, all governments are recognizing the importance of uh, broadband uh, deployment in driving their economies. And I think that the benefits of broadband uh, is well known to all. However, in Hong Kong, we have a different approach. Consistent with our uh, market-driven policy, the government has never been involved in uh, investing or in subsidizing any telecom infrastructure. So telecom networks wholly rely on private sector investment, and we believe that the market is more suitable to design on the form and pace of development for broadband infrastructure, in fact, for all kinds of telecom infrastructure. The proper role for the government is to play a facilitating role. The regulator should create a conducive regulatory environment so that there would be uh, minimum barriers to investment on telecommunication infrastructure, and the government should uh, play a role to facilitate the role of, of broadband networks by the private sector. So uh, I give a few statistics to demonstrate that this approach really works in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is a small place with an area of uh, 1,100 square kilometer, but it is densely populated with uh, 7 million people. Uh, we have started the liberalization of the telecommunications sector in uh, 1995 and after 15 years of liberalization, we now have uh, 11 fixed network operators and five mobile network operators. And the competition in all aspects of uh, telecommunication services is uh, fierce. I could, I would, I'll say that. At present, our broadband networks cover 97% of households and they are achieved by a variety of broadband technologies like XDSL, uh, the hybrid fiber coaxial, and also the FTTBH, FTTB technologies, providing up to one gigabit per second. Uh, last year, we have seen a new broadband operator promoting a broadband package for 100 megabit per second at the price of less than 100 Hong Kong dollars. That means um, a little bit less than 13 US dollars. So um, it seems that the, the price and the quality and the, the spread of the broadband access are driven by competition. And in Hong Kong, we benefit not only at a surface level based uh, competition, but also a high level of facility-based competition. Uh, according to our statistic, uh, at present, 85% of households in Hong Kong have at least two self-built networks, and for 66% of them, they are in fact free networks. And uh, our FTTH coverage, or oh no, 
per, uh, penetration. Uh, now uh, exceed 30% is ranked second in the world according to the previous survey I've mentioned done by the FDDH Council. Uh, if we look at today, the broadband penetration uh, is a 79% household, but we must not forget broadband only come into the scene in the year 2000. So within 10 years, we have zero penetration for the household broadband surface to nearly 80%. And we also have an uh, excellent external connectivity and also an a ubiquitous Wi-Fi network uh, covering nearly 9,000 hotspots um, in Hong Kong and the government also provide uh, free internet access via Wi-Fi at uh, some 370 government premises like libraries, uh, recreation centers and uh, museums and so on. Apart from fixed broadband, mobile broadband is also taking off. In Hong Kong, we have four 3 g operators and now they have all rolled out 3.5G technology using HSDPA, providing up to 21 megabit per second speed. And uh, in last month, uh, we have done a, a, a survey among the prices of mobile broadband in Hong Kong. And uh, we found that uh, we are able to have a package of uh, uh, $188 US, uh, no, Hong Kong dollars. That means uh, about uh, 25 US dollars for unlimited uh, data usage up to uh, 7.2 megabit per second. And in the future, we see that there will be more broadband uh, providers in the mobile sector. Last year, we have uh, put our auction, put our spectrum for auction in the 2.5 and 2.6 gigahertz band. And three operators have successfully beat the spectrum. And we expect them to have trials within this year and roll the surface based on the LTE technologies. So we will see that uh, like the traditional telephony, the mobile broadband will take up as fast as the mobile telephony in the future. And in fact, some people are projecting that the mobile broadband may be at some point in time surpass the fixed broadband. Uh, we only have uh, mobile broadband starting from 2002, and so within six to seven years' time, we have climbed to a rate, penetration rate of about 40%. And if we look at the mobile data traffic, it's even more impressive. We have an explosion of data usage in the last three years. And last year alone, we witnessed a drum of four times for the mobile data usage. So um, what's the customers are using broadband for? Uh, the government in Hong Kong has done some kind of an annual survey. And according to the last survey done last year, we have uh, some interesting observation. Uh, we surveyed the customer demand for uh, broadband services among different age groups in Hong Kong. And these are the top six uh, most popular applications. And if you look at these figures, we can observe that for uh, use of the internet to do information searching, it is a common application across all age groups, no matter teenagers, middle age, or the senior people. But for the youngsters, um, the more appealing applications nowadays are the networking, online digital entertainment, downloading of software. And these applications are more bandwidth hungry. So our conclusion is that uh, we will have a continued and sustained demand for bandwidth in the future. And we also see that the access to internet and the need for broadband is not only for the youngsters, but in fact the same usage pattern 
is rolling out to the more aged people. And in fact, if you look at the survey, it seems that maybe surprised to, to some of you, even people over the age of 55 are using internet for various kinds of applications. And so I've been uh, in the forum yesterday and some people are talking about the communication literacy for the teenagers. But you see, in 10 years time, these teenagers will become adults. They will become middle-aged people. And so the trend is obvious. Broadband is for all. The broadband demand is clear. So it is up to us, operators, regulators, government and the private sectors to work together to meet this sustained and clear demand. So what's the approach we are using in Hong Kong? Consistent with a um, pro-competition and pro-consumer policy adopted by the government, the regulator has been following a market-driven approach to the regulation of the telecommunication sector. All the telecom companies are privately owned with no government participation or subsidy, and there is no foreign ownership restriction. The government or the regulator will minimize intervention in the market and let the market serve public interest to the maximum extent and the regulator will only step in if there is some deficiency in market competition. Under this market-led approach, we presume that the, the market is wiser or better than the government in making commercial investment, and there is no need for government intervention unless the market fails to achieve public policy objectives. We are a little bit concerned about the role of government in making direct investment in broadband networks because we are concerned that this will inadvertently affect the business case of the private investors, may to some extent dampen the investment sentiment, and last but not least, it may create some expectation that the public will become reliant on government funding for future telecom infrastructure. On the other hand, we think that the role of the government should be um, a facilitator. We prefer to adopt a more light-handed regulated approach that encourage facility-based competition and rely on market force to drive telecommunication infrastructure development we will create an enabling environment conducive to business investment. Our role is to safeguard the public interest, including the promotion and the enforcement of effective competition to establish a clear, transparent and predictable regulatory framework to, for the business to make investment in and to make a uh, level playing field for all the parties. Having said that, there is a role for the regulator to play. And in Hong Kong, we have adopted a package of measures in order to facilitate broadband deployment by, by the private sector. First, the regulator will coordinate with various uh, government departments for major infrastructure projects like highways, uh, tunnels, and also the new train routes so that the um, infrastructure requirements of telecom operators like uh, new optical cables, uh, radio base stations, and so on, will be incorporated in this uh, in major infrastructure projects so that the operators can uh, make more economic um, deployment of these uh, telecom facilities. Second, we will allow the operators to make use of government and public facilities like roads, highways, bridges, tunnels, lamp posts, and even payphone kiosks for installation of their telecom cables and radio base stations. And we will only charge them a nominal rental fee for using these public facilities to install the telecom facilities. Third, 
we are aware that um, the fixed broadband will have a limited coverage as far as uh, more remote and rural areas are concerned. So in this regard, we encourage the mobile operators to extend their mobile broadband coverage to these more uh, remote and rural areas. We will assign frequencies for them to build microwave backhaul networks, and we will also allow the mobile operators to use hilltop sites to construct uh, radio base stations in order to have a better coverage of their radio network in the rural areas. Fourth, we will release radio spectrum as soon as they are available through market-based mechanisms such as uh, spectrum auction so that the spectrum will go to the parties which makes the best use of this radio spectrum. Last year, we have successfully auctioned spectrum in the 2.5, 2.6 gigahertz band for broadband wireless access, and we expect them, uh, the, the bidders, will use this spectrum to roll out um, new mobile broadband networks based on LTE technologies. And for this year, we will uh, have two more spectrum uh, auctions. One is in the um, UHF band for mobile TV service, and another is in the uh, 800 and 900 and also the 18,000 megahertz bands for um, the new, uh, maybe the GSM or the LTE or the whatever kind of technology based on the technology neutral approach. Fifth. We are now um, considering to launch a registration scheme for buildings with optical fiber-based access networks. We will um, launch a voluntary scheme such that networks uh, or buildings covered by FTTH network will be qualified as a star gray. And for buildings with um, FTTB coverage, it will be classified as a quality brand. These proposals are under consultation, but we believe that uh, this kind of scheme, though voluntary in nature, will encourage the operators to have more incentive in rolling out their optical fiber networks. And for the consumers, they will have more transparent information as to whether their buildings are covered by optical fiber networks. And for the building owners, we expect that it will create better value for their buildings. So this is a win-win strategy for all. And finally, uh, we will streamline procedure in order to allow interested parties to land submarine cables in Hong Kong. The regulator officer will act as the single point of contact for interested parties uh, to make an application to different government agencies like marine, lands, town planning, and environmental agencies to obtain the necessary statutory approval to uh, make the entering works in constructing new cable landing stations as well as expansion of existing ones. Finally, my conclusion is that the government plays an important role in driving broadband infrastructure development. We have seen a mix of approach from different Asian economies, including the government-led approach, such as the government will directly invest and build a network, or the government provides some kind of funding through relevant subsidy, loans, and incentive schemes. But we also see a market-led approach such as those that adopted in Hong Kong, in which the government play a fascinating role by using a package of policy and regulatory measures to help broadband roll out by the private sector. No particular approach, I must emphasize, is absolutely right or wrong. It really depends on the state of development for individual economies, and it will depend on a number of factors, including competitiveness in the telecommunications market, incentives for private investment in that economy, as well as policy, public policy objectives. So I will conclude my presentation here. I look forward to more stimulating exchanges with the audience. Thank you. Well, I think that's probably left us all slightly envious, talk of um, 
getting a 100 megs connection for $13. I guess I have to say in the UK, the norm would be to get um, an 8 megs connection for something like $40. Um, so we've got a long way to go in the UK to catch up with Hong Kong, as I'm sure the rest of the world has. Anyway, moving on, the final presentation before we move to the general discussion is from Professor Cole of the University of Southern California Annenberg Center, and he's going to talk about broadband and the consumer. Thank you, Martin. I'm actually getting very comfortable up here. Uh, about three and a half years ago, the Minister of Communications in Australia said that no one other than a downloading pirate or a pornographer would ever need more than one megabit per second of internet speed. Now, I mention that not to criticize her, but to show how foolish it is to predict what the demand's going to be if 100 megs, which sounds like far more than we could ever want today, will actually be enough when all those 100 meg systems get built. But I believe, and I, I'm gonna, for those of you who heard me yesterday, I'm going to repeat about 15 seconds of what I said yesterday and then go into a whole discussion of broadband. I believe that broadband is not just a faster internet, that broadband changes everything, that there's a bigger gap between dial-up and broadband than there is between non-use and dial-up. And let me show you some of the ways we found in our work tracking people in 30 countries around the world how broadband does change everything. If you think back to the dial-up era, if you think back to your household in those days of the annoying whirls and clicks, we saw the average dial-up household went online two to three times a day for 20 to 30 minutes at a time. We went online in these buckets of minutes because we aggregated our tasks, or we combined our tasks. We'd write down in the back of an envelope all the things we wanted to do before we logged on, and we, got ver and we viewed dialing up as a big deal. If we logged off forgetting to do something, we'd get really irritated at ourselves. So we would go online for 20 or 30 minutes, one of the first things we saw in dial-up was where people had a choice, they would move the internet into the backstage of the home, if their home had a backstage. If you lived in a studio apartment or a college dormitory, you didn't have a backstage, but where people had a choice, they would move the internet into a back bedroom, an office, some place to be undisturbed for these 20 or 30 minutes. And as we went online, it was generally in a bucket of 20 or 30 minutes spent not talking to the other members of the household, although they could wander into the back stage of the home and talk to you. And it was generally 20 or 30 minutes spent not watching television, although many people had a television in the back stage of the home and were multitasking from the very beginning. Broadband comes along, we saw beginning in about 2000, but for most of us, 2003, 4, 5, and 6, and all of a sudden, people weren't online two or three times a day. We were online 30, 40, 50 times a day, not for 20 or 30 minutes at a time, but for two or three minutes at a time. No longer in buckets of minutes, but pockets of minutes. We could go on for shorter amounts because we didn't have to aggregate or combine our tasks. We could go to the web since it was always on, do two or three things, and if we remembered a third or fourth thing two minutes later, we just came back and did it again because it was there waiting for us. Well, since we were going online 30, 40, 50 times a day, we didn't want the internet in the backstage of the home. We wanted it in the center stage of the home. We wanted it where we are, one of the themes we're going to see of all future internet development. We want it where we happen to be. So we began to move the internet out of the backstage of the home into the center stage of the home, into the family room, into the den, and into the most humanly networked room in the house. Most of you probably know the kitchen. The kitchen, the first room in which most people stop when they first enter the home, the room in which most women leave their purses. If you're going to leave a message for another member of the household, you almost always do so in the kitchen. In most cultures, the kitchen also contains the family art gallery, also known as the refrigerator. So we were moving the internet to where we are 
to where we were living. We wanted it close to us. We wanted it integrated into our lives. And then as Wi-Fi came along, all of a sudden we could move it upstairs, into the backyard, into the garage, into the front yard, anywhere. As a matter of fact, about four years ago, the Wall Street Journal called us, really interested in our work on the use of the internet in the kitchen, and they wanted to know what our work showed about the use of the internet in the bathroom. And I had to admit, it never dawned on me to even ask whether people were using the internet in the bathroom. So they went off and did their own study. We gave them a little bit of technical advice. And they found that of those that had Wi-Fi, because you had to have Wi-Fi. I don't think there's a person on earth who's ever hardwired their bathroom, or at least I hope there isn't. But they found that of those that have Wi-Fi, over 50% use the internet at least some of the time in the bathroom. And when I first heard this, I was sort of puzzled because I realized, well, you can't use it in the shower or the tub, and then how classless to use it sitting. But then I realized every hotel room I ever stay in, including this beautiful hotel here, has a telephone in the bathroom, and the telephone is not next to the tub, and it's not next to the shower, and it's far less classy to be on the telephone than it is to be on the internet. But to clean this up, what the journal found was the majority of people using the internet in the bathroom used it sitting on the toilet with the lid closed. They used it as a refuge, as a place to have privacy, to get away from the chaos of the other people in the household. So all of a sudden, with broadband, it's not interfering with family conversation time. It's occurring during the natural rhythms of family conversations. And it's not interfering with television programming viewing anymore. All of a sudden, since we're going online in these pockets of minutes, we're going online before the program starts, after it ends, or even more worrisome for some broadcasters, it becomes another thing we do during the commercial. Broadband is turning out to be the best friend television has ever had. Broadband is moving television not just from that set on the schedule in our home, but to our mobile phones, to everywhere in our lives. As I mentioned very briefly yesterday, television is escaping from the home. Television's becoming our constant companion. It's going with us everywhere. Who's our constant companion now? If we're stuck at the airport waiting for a flight, most of us don't pull out a book or a newspaper. We pull out a mobile phone and start calling people. It's only after someone answers do we figure out whether we really have anything we want to say to them. My mother figured this out a long time ago. Whenever I call my mother, she'll say, what, you're stuck somewhere? You have nothing better to do than to call me? And she's right, but she also figured out, hey, it means we get to talk more often. Newspapers. I talked a little bit about yesterday about how newspapers in every country in the world where internet penetration is over 30 percent, printed newspaper sales are beginning to decline, and that every time a newspaper reader dies, they're not being replaced by a new reader. Broadband is going to be the savior, I think, of some newspapers. Because broadband changes everything for newspapers as they go online. If you look here in Qatar, if you look at your English newspaper peninsula, there's no way it could ever compete with the English language edition of Al Jazeera. In the UK, there's no way The Guardian could ever compete with the BBC. It's a matter of timeliness. We wanted to see, since newspapers only come out once a day, if you're standing on your doorstep the moment that newspaper arrives, it's already six hours out of date. If you read a story and you want an update, you have to wait 24 hours. We wanted to see how up to the moment does a newspaper on the web have to be. The answer is 30 to 60 seconds. If I'm driving home listening to a game, I pull into the garage, I walk into the house and into the kitchen and say hello to everybody and then go to the internet. I don't want the score 20 or 30 minutes ago. I want to know what happened in the two or three minutes since I parked my car. Well, there's no way a newspaper in its old form as a printed newspaper could ever compete with television. 
televisions live, it has audio, it has video. Newspapers are once a day, they have no audio, they have no video, they only have still pictures, most of them in black and white, but increasingly in color. But as newspapers go on the web, that all disappears. As newspapers go on the web, they have audio, they have video, they become live. And just as my favorite cartoon from the 90s, some of you may know this cartoon, showed a dog sitting in front of a computer with the caption, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Well, today, on the internet, no one knows you're a newspaper. Because newspapers, what you used to be. On the internet, newspapers, we'll need a new term, we're not gonna get one, but we need a new term. Newspapers can compete with television and have a future and become much more important than they've ever been. One of the things we saw worldwide, we saw it in the US and the UK and Japan and Australia, but we saw it in a few other places as well. During the global financial crisis, at the height of it, a small percentage of households decided they would give up broadband as a way to save money. They would revert back to dial-up. Maybe they had nostalgia for those whirls and clicks, but clearly it was a way to save money. But what we found was the people who gave up broadband came back almost immediately. They didn't realize that whole swaths of the internet they had grown accustomed to, starting with things like YouTube and video, were not even conceivable in a dial-up era. What we're learning is that broadband has become an indispensable part of internet life. That broadband really has become the backbone of our lives. And we notice profoundly when something changes. As I was a graduate student, one of the most interesting studies I can remember occurred in New York City in 1948 on the eve of the introduction of television during a newspaper strike when because of printing press and union issues, all newspapers stopped publishing. And after about three weeks, Bernard Berelson, a great sociologist, studied what was happening to the people of New York who weren't getting their newspapers. And they were going through withdrawal, they were confused, some of them made charming comments like breakfast just didn't make sense anymore without a newspaper. But I would argue today that of all the newspapers in the world ground to a halt, no one under the age of 30 would even notice. But if the internet stopped for 15 minutes, they would go through serious pangs of withdrawal. We really are in a world where broadband has completely integrated the internet into everything we do, into every moment of our lives. If you look at the recent Kaiser Family Study that came out last month, it shows that teenagers spend practically every waking moment in front of a screen, except when they're in school, and even some of them do that in school as well. We've also seen with broadband some extraordinary and very inspiring, although there can be uninspiring stories as well, inspiring stories of collaboration. In 2003, when we were experiencing the SARS virus, and if you remember back to that point, we didn't know if that was the next new black plague, if that was gonna kill tens of millions of people. Thankfully, it didn't. But before SARS, to diagnose a virus, a new virus traditionally took about nine months to a year. Lots of competition between medical teams. Well, all of a sudden, this was the first virus they wanted to die, they tried to diagnose in the age of the internet. And what we found was that European and Middle Eastern laboratories would work all day, and as they went to sleep, they would share their work with American and Canadian laboratories. And as the Americans and Canadians went to sleep, they would then share that work with the Asian laboratories so that all of a sudden people could actually do three times as much work in the same day. The SARS virus was diagnosed as a crown virus in nine days, something that wasn't conceivable before the internet, that there could be that much immediate collaboration. Something not quite as dramatic in importance, but just showing as dramatic in its ability to mobilize, when the latest Harry Potter book was released. In China, it was announced that it was gonna take about six to eight months for the Chinese translation of the latest Harry Potter book. 
Instead of waiting, fans of Harry Potter in China simply divided up by pages the book, translated it within three days. The entire Harry Potter book was available in China. I'm not sure it was licensed properly, but if they wanted it to be licensed properly, they should have gotten it out on time. So we're seeing extraordinary changes in our lives. You saw from Dr. Hesse and you heard from others everything that's happening in distance learning, telemedicine, all of these exciting and dramatic changes. And I think we're going to see this become a key part of all of our lives. As I mentioned yesterday, and as many of you know, the government of Finland has already declared that the right to have high-speed broadband is a fundamental civil right in Finnish society. I think that's a pretty bold statement and stance to take. I think the rest of the world's going to follow some parts of it more slowly than others. We know one of the questions I get asked frequently, and many of you get asked as well, is what's, how are we going to know or when are we going to get to Web 3.0 or Web 4.0 or what's the next killer app or the next new thing? I don't know any of those things. And seriously, I'm not being disingenuous when I say I'm not even sure what Web 2.0 means. But I do know we get to the next level, the level that all of your presentations so articulately talked about. We get to the next level when we never talk about broadband speed ever again. When broadband simply does what we need it to do and becomes like electricity. When you walk into your home and flip the switch, you're not flipping it hoping against hope that there's enough power in there to run all of your appliances. It just does everything you want it to do and you don't notice it unless there's a power outage and then you realize everything in your life is based on electricity. But when we no longer think about broadband speed and importantly for uploading as well as downloading. Uploading got really relegated to a distant second place in the year 2000. No one ever conceiving of the kind of uploading that we started doing three, four, five years ago. The, thing, the feeling was that uploading would only be things like email or things like that. So when we never talk about broadband speed ever again, when we can do whatever we want, when we want it, on our schedule, the way we want it, sometimes we'll pay and avoid advertising, sometimes we'll take advertising and avoid paying, and it's always on and it's always there, I think we've gotten to the next level. Thank you.